Well, uh, today I'm going to share with you a case about public-private uh, partnership that went all the way from free clinical uh, to the delivery of uh, vaccines to the strategic national stockpile uh, here in the U.S. Um, it is, uh, of course, our product, uh, the third generation smallpox vaccine called Immune. I'm talking about. And I'm going to talk about three areas uh, today. The first one is a little background on smallpox and the current available countermeasures against that. And I'm going to share with you some of the details on uh, the structure of this public-private partnership that uh, led to the successful de development of a new vaccine. And then, of course, I'll share some details on our vaccine. First, I remember when I was in medical school, uh, I had heard about smallpox. Smallpox, was, all of you know, was declared eradicated by WHO in 1980. I think I read half a page during my medical school and then I forgot about it. Um, so first I want to share a little background and I actually found an old uh, doku drama made by the BBC uh, in UK. It's a little dramatic, but it shows some of the details on smallpox and why we should be worried about eradicated uh, disease. So uh, would you please turn on the movie? It's five minutes. We knew that smallpox existed that it could be used as a bioterrorism um, weapon. And I had been trying for a long time to get people to be proactive in this, to be creating more um, vaccine, to establish a workbook of exactly what we should be doing should something like this happen. It wasn't until the anthrax attacks that people took me seriously. We used to believe that the greatest threat to the United States were the nuclear arsenals of a rogue state. But in this world today, a terrorist with the will to sacrifice his own life, armed only with a pen knife and a pilot's license, is capable of anything. The greatest threat, as we now know, to our lives and security is a single individual with a $50 chemistry set and the will to decimate the planet. In the 20th century, smallpox killed more people than all the century's wars combined. It is one of the most contagious airborne viruses known to man. A third of those who contract the disease die. In 1962, the World Health Organization launched a vaccination campaign to rid the world of smallpox forever. By 1980, they had succeeded. Vaccination stopped. The only living samples of the virus were safely locked inside two maximum security laboratories, one in Russia and one in the United States. Or so the world believed. In the 1960s, the Soviet Union was one of the driving nations behind the campaign to eradicate smallpox. But this was at the height of the Cold War. Unwittingly, many of the Soviet doctors were sending smallpox samples back to the Russian military. To the generals, the eradication of the disease presented a unique opportunity. If there is no smallpox, uh, it means nobody would be vaccinated anymore. If nobody is vaccinated, uh, a new biological weapon uh, based on smallpox would be the most powerful and effective weapon ever created to eliminate uh, uh, human life. 
In the 1980s, Dr. Ken Alabek held the rank of colonel in the Soviet army. His job, to oversee the secret development of a massive bioweapons program using a specially selected strain of smallpox. The major strain used uh, in the Soviet Union uh, had a code name India-1. It was a uh, highly virulent, uh, highly contagious agent and it was uh, not very difficult to adopt uh, this uh, strain for uh, existing technological processes. Although it was consistently denied to the West, Biopreparat, the Soviet biological weapons program, was producing deadly diseases on an industrial scale. Inside these laboratories, Ebola, tularemia, anthrax, and smallpox were all weaponized. They were then loaded into missiles to be unleashed on the West in the event of total war. We call uh, biological weapons weapons of mass destruction. It's a very significant mistake. Biological weapons are not weapon, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Biological weapons are mass casualty weapons. Biological weapons don't destroy non-living entities. They just infect and kill people. It wasn't until 1992, when Ken Alabek defected to America, that the full scale of the Soviet biological weapons program became apparent. The size and scope of the research and development program was enormous. Upwards of 60,000 people worked in, in BioPreparat alone. Um, large numbers of, of experts in every aspect of, of the biological sciences and microbiology and, uh, uh, and the like. Uh, almost really the, the flower of a, of a generation of the most clever people. Uh, in some instances, ended up in, in the program. In the 80s and 90s, hundreds of tons of smallpox were stockpiled in Soviet laboratories. Real concerns existed over the security of these facilities. With the breakup of the Soviet Union, the support to the laboratories where the, vac the virus was being made diminished sharply. And between a third and a half of all the scientists left the laboratories to go to many places. And let us face it, these are scientists with families and what have you and, and no money. And so you could certainly hire these people as consultants very easily at very low prices, and many countries did. The fear was that samples of the virus had traveled with them. There are many, in my opinion, non-official stocks of smallpox virus. It's of course a rather dramatic way of showing it. It's from uh, 2002. And the concern at that point was that someone could get access to smallpox, either old samples or some of the war programs that were there in the old days. A lot has happened since 2002. And the majority of our protection has actually been the unavailability of the virus. But I like this movie because since 2002, a lot has happened in synthetic biology. In 2002, the polio virus was recreated from scratch. Then the Spanish flu, SARS, then mucoplasma. And I think it was in May last year that the Craig Winter Institute recreated a microorganism more than one million base pairs. Smallpox is 185,000 base pairs. Both the WHO and a lot of institutes here in the US know that it is possible to recreate the smallpox virus from scratch. And it's something that's getting easier every day. So the challenge now is that a potential weapon of mass destruction or weapon of mass casualties is within reach of state and non-state actors. So this uh, disease, even though it's eradicated and we stopped vaccinated, actually created a new problem. The herd immunity of today's population is almost non-existing. For 35 to 40 years, we have not vaccinated anyone. And we actually have not had a situation like that in human history. In the old days, we vaccinated, and before that, people contracted smallpox as kids 
and either died or survived or ran into the disease continuously and had immunity. That's not the case anymore. So we have an extreme dangerous virus and we have a population that is totally unprotected. So what many governments do, they stockpile vaccines for every citizen in case this should happen, naturally or in a deliberate attack. One of the important factors when we talk about smallpox is this should be considered more a national security threat than a health uh, problem. If this was used in some kind of deliberate attack, we could end up having thousands of initial cases and that could uh, quickly overwhelm our public health systems. There's no, currently no treatment available, so it's a virus with a mortality around 30% and the only protection now is vaccinations. This is the black box warning label on uh, one of the traditional vaccines. And those are also the ones we use to eradicate smallpox. Uh, actually, there has been no development in smallpox vaccines since the, uh, the, the 50s. And, uh, and these are the same products that uh, are licensed today. It mentioned that uh, 5.7 out of 1,000 healthy people get myopericarditis, that it may result in permanent sequelae or death. And then in some individuals, uh, uh, the risk is even higher. And this is a vaccine. This is normally something I'm used to seeing in chemotherapy. So the challenge was that the O vaccines were unsafe. And on top of that, some part of the population stand at even higher risk of getting severe side effects, getting these uh, vaccines. And those are people uh, that are immune compromised, people who have cardiac diseases, eczema, and uh, anyone that are actually in close contact with someone who has one of those uh, contraindications. The reason for that is the old vaccines is a live replicating virus and you do a local infection in the skin and you run around with that virus for more than three weeks. So if you're in a household with someone who has a contraindicating to get the old vaccines, if you get vaccinated, you can infect them and they can get this side effect. So there was a need for a safer uh, vaccine. And already in uh, 99, this is before 9-11, it's before the anthrax attack, uh, my company was approached by the NIH uh, because we have a technology based on MVA, modified vaccinia anchora. And they actually asked us and funded early clinical and animal studies to produce a, a better smallpox vaccine. And that uh, partnership was uh, further developed in 2003 when we received a contract with the NIH for phase one and phase two and early production of a new and uh, safer vaccine. Then in 2004, uh, yet another contract. These contracts were all requests for proposal. So of course there were more uh, companies than ours going for these uh, development contracts. Uh, but lucky for us, we want them. Uh, the one in 2004 was the industrialization of the production, phase two studies, and the delivery of half a million doses. Then in 2007, the main contract was awarded to the company, which was the delivery of 20 million doses uh, of uh, Invamu, uh, the funding of phase three, and the licensing for healthy adults. And then even further in 2009, uh, a new contract, uh, which was a freeze-dried free formulation of our vaccine, was awarded. And actually yesterday, uh, that contract was increased by 54 million uh, to do further study and development in freeze-dried. An important factor in these private-public uh, uh, partnership is that this was dual investment and commitment. My company also invested a lot of money in this development, besides the money that was uh, given uh, through contracts with the US government. And the critical factor in the success of this program was the upfront and milestone payment, which was a strategic change that was done in these public-private partnerships to defeat the valley of death. There's more uh, programs than ours uh, looking to develop medical countermeasures. And a lot of these companies broke their neck in the valley of death 
uh, because of the lack of funding. Um, so this new strategy to have upfront and milestone payment as part of the development on specific uh, milestones is extremely important and was one of the factors that was critical for this success. We delivered the first doses of this vaccine in 2010. Uh, and this is a line of the development. Uh, first, we fulfilled the data requirement from 2006 to 2008. In March, FDA accepted the data. Then CDC requested confirmation from the FDA. And then we got the green light to deliver to the strategic national stockpile. And so far, we've delivered 2 million out of 20 million doses to the stockpile. It is, hasn't finished phase uh, three uh, and it's stockpiled under emergency use uh, authorization, which is a special authorization that the um, FDA can grant to CDC in case of an emergency. And that would allow the use of our product in people with HIV. And in the future, we hope to expand that policy to include people with atopic dermatitis, which we all know is a huge part of, uh, especially among children, um, and we have done the studies in that patient population. And uh, we are planning to start phase three and get it licensed in uh, healthy adults. There's, of course, a lot of institutes we work with uh, in the development of MMU. Uh, the NIH for the early phase, BADA for the advanced development and the delivery to the strategic national stockpile, the CDC, who manage and maintain uh, the stockpile, who has the utilization policies, the preparedness plans, et cetera, and of course, FDA on the manufacturing, on the, the protocols and licensing. This is a picture of uh, the third generation smallpox vaccine, Immunimmune. It's based on our vaccine vector, which is uh, MVA, modified vaccinia anchor. And that is actually derived from vaccinia, which is the uh, original smallpox vaccine. It has been attenuated in uh, chicken embryo fibroblast and was renamed after 516 passages to modified vaccinia ankara. And uh, in the end, after further attenuated, uh, attenuation and uh, plaque purification, we ended up with MVA-BN, which is the foundation of all our vaccines, uh, or the majority of our vaccines in our pipeline. And uh, this is an immunogenic vector that has lost the capacity to replicate in human cells, and thus solves some of the safety issues that are related to live viral vectors. We have 19 completed or ongoing clinical trials uh, with our smallpox vaccine, both in healthy HIV subject, atopic dermatitis, and elderly. Uh, we're entering phase three. We are vaccinated people that uh, cannot receive the traditional vaccine, which are people with HIV, atopic dermatitis. More than 5,000 vaccinations has been administered. We have extensive animal uh, data studies done, thousands of miles uh, of mice, uh, hundreds of non-human primates, and so far 240, uh, uh, 2,400 healthy people more than 600 HIV patients and also 380 people with AD has been vaccinated with our vaccine. A little about the safety profile. Um, we have vaccinated this amount of people and also the people who are considered contraindicated. We have seen no cases of myopericarditis, something we see in one out of 175 receiving the traditional vaccines, and we have, of course, in all our protocols, screened vigorously for this. Uh, it is non-replicating in all human cell lines, and, uh, of course, in theory, that uh, gives less uh, safety concern, and also, of course, uh, do not carry a risk of auto-inoculation or infecting others with the vaccines. We also see none of the serious adverse events that people fear using traditional vaccines. On the efficacy side, we have shown that a single vaccination with immune is as efficacious as the traditional vaccines in animal models. It gives a non-inferior immune response compared to them. It works faster, and that's not by magic. That's because 
a dose response because the vector does not replicate. We can load people up with a higher dose. So we actually use 400 times the dose that are used in traditional vaccines, where the traditional vaccine, you have to create a local infection that has to replicate before it creates an immune response. Uh, it induced a long-term immunity, and the CDC did a study where they compared variola neutralization, which is variola is a smallpox virus, so they compared seria from people vaccinated with traditional vaccines uh, compared to people vaccinated with our vaccine, and they saw a comparable uh, neutralization, and actually it suggested that uh, our new vaccine was actually better at uh, neutralizing variola. A little about our company. Uh, we have uh, Immune, uh, which is our uh, 3rd generation smallpox vaccine in the pipeline. We also have an anthrax vaccine based on the same vector. Philo vaccine, uh, which is the hemorrhagic fever, Ebola, Marpo, um, HIV, RSV. And then um, cancer vaccine. And I think it was a good speak you gave. We actually have a cancer vaccine, uh, which is uh, based on a combination of uh, vaccinia uh, prime and foul pox uh, boost, and it's actually entering phase three in uh, 2011, which is now. Uh, and uh, we have strong data, uh, phase two data, uh, which showed an 8.5 month increased survival in people with metastatic prostate cancer. That uh, ends my uh, speak, so uh, if there are any uh, questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Any I have one. Yes. Uh, the duration of immunity provided by your vaccine. Excuse me? The duration of immunity. Well, so far we have a follow-up uh, two years after. Uh, because, of course, we have to have done the clinical studies and do a follow-up study, and, and we, act, we have two years in, in, in humans, and we also have animal data that shows uh, minimum two years. Thank you very much. Thank you.